to us and our young people. If you take your Bibles and join me in Mark chapter 14, we want to finish up Mark chapter 14 this morning with a look at Peter's denials. But again, before we dig into our study of the Word of God, we want to ask God's Spirit who inspired Scripture to teach us its meaning and what it looks like in daily practice. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your spirit who moved the human writers of Old and New Testament books so that what they write or wrote was indeed the Word of God. It finds its source in you. It's inspired. It's authoritative over us. It is inerrant, has no errors in it, and it's absolutely sufficient answering all the pertinent questions of life. Help us to dig into it like never before. Anchor our lives in the bedrock of your unchanging truth. Thank you that on these pages you reveal yourself and all your glorious splendor. And it reduces us to rubble as we recognize our sinful, needy stat- stature that Christ came to redeem. Thank you for the privilege to study your word. Use it mightily as you speak to your church. For your glory we ask. Amen. I'd like to preach to a sermon that I've entitled The Historic Denial of Epic Proportion. Historic Denial of Epic Proportion from Mark 14, verses 66 to 72. There's not a lot of characters in this account, only a few players. You've got the servant girl, you've got a few bystanders, and Peter, the disciple with second thoughts. While Jesus is on trial above, probably on the second story of the high priest's house, there's a trial of a different sort below in the courtyard, a trial of Peter's heart and his allegiance. This is a lesson on overconfidence, self-confidence, which is doomed to failure. We've already looked at Judas's betrayal, and he had planned out ahead of time that the sign of his betrayal would be kissing Jesus. So the Judas kiss lives on in infamy. Judas goat, we know his purpose to lead others with him in decimation. So Judas's name is a name of betrayal, but the name of Peter brings up different thoughts. That of one who is impulsive, impetuous Peter, as you may refer to him, a man of pride, overconfidence. There is no doubt that Peter loves Jesus, but the carrying out in demonstrable ways is quite lacking because to think of the apostle Peter is to think about this account and his thrice betrayal of his Lord. Would you read the text? Follow along as I read for us in Mark 14, beginning in verse 66. As Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus the Nazarene. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're talking about. And we went on onto the porch. The servant girl saw him and began once more to say to the bystanders, this is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders were again saying to Peter, surely you're one of them. You're a Galilean too. But he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man you are talking about. Immediately, a rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had made the remark to him, Before a rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he began to weep. Beloved, beware of not only the betrayal that we see in the life of Peter, but as we've been studying the Gospel of Mark, we've talked about how that we're meant by the narrators, whether it be Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, to see ourselves in their faces. They are us lest we get too cocky in the Christian life. So beware of the betrayal that lurks within. And while in grace, remembering that restoration awaits the penitent heart. 
To, to say that is to say this. We do not believe in a cheap grace. We're not cheapening grace and taking advantage that because coming to Christ and walking with Christ is a matter of grace, that doesn't give us an excuse for our sin. That I like to sin and God likes to forgive. That's bad theology. So we don't cheapen grace. We don't abuse grace by making excuses. But grace frees your obedience. Because he's gone all the way to Golgotha's cross to purchase a bride. He's done everything possible to rescue sinful man. Everything needed so that you can place your faith in the finished work of Jesus, not your own righteousness, which are filthy rags. So grace frees your obedience so that you're sober and alert, never wanting to disgrace the Lord because He's done so much. How could I tarnish His name and break this love relationship by serving myself and my sin? Now, there's an outline on the back of your bulletin I'd remind you of, and it's not even accurate. You know, I, I don't know when I did the bulletins, maybe Friday night. I printed them yesterday, but I never... i got to give you a point before we look at the points. Fair enough? So this is the, the pre-point, the backstory of overconfidence. Some of you may not have been to all of our series in the Gospel of Mark and realize where we've been in Gethsemane with our Savior. And we need to understand the backstory about Peter. How has he been behaving? What led up to this historic denial? I'm glad you asked. Let me answer that. And after we get the pre-point, the backstory done, we'll get into the rest of our message. When somebody places repentant faith in Christ, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.17, they're new creatures in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You're a new creature, not a remade old creature. Believers understand that their flesh their body and mind is still fallen. When God forgives us of our sin, we wish He would have took, taken it all away and that we uh, become sinlessly perfect this side of eternity. It just doesn't work that way. Those who have been bought by the blood of Jesus have experienced the redemption of their souls, but not yet their bodies. Paul talks about our... This, the this body of our tent, which gets more holes in it, the more we, the older we get. And even with people going through the, this strain of cold that's going around, it's a reminder of our weakness. We are in a fallen, broken world. And our bodies remind us of that every time we get up in the morning with a crick in the neck and the pains. So the old self and its remaining corruption, spiritually speaking, has to be continually put to death. Constantly identifying ourselves as crucified with Christ on the cross. We are new creatures, not old. The old man wants to put his head above the, the wall and say, I'm, I'm still alive to our, our own desires, our old loves. No, your, your religious affections have changed. The sin that you used to love, now you hate. And the, the righteousness you used to spurn, now you love. And how do we work it out and change? Though the regenerated spirit desires to pursue righteousness, the flesh is prone to weakness and sin. As Jesus said in Gethsemane, not too many moments before this text, uh, when he said, watch and pray, disciples, and he goes and watches and prays, and he finds them snoozing all three times. They weren't watching and praying, and he said, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is what? It's weak. We're prone to wander. Paul expressed in a humble and honest way in Romans 7, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death. That's the confession and the cry of desperation of every true believer. God, I'm not doing what I want to do. I want to practice this righteousness more consistently as a thank you gift for what Christ has poured and lavished into my life through His grace. The Bible teaches all men and women as members of a fallen human race are weak and sinful and corrupt. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, not even one. That conversion 
believers are regenerated through the power of the Spirit. So that their desires and aspirations and longings change to reflect that new creature we are in Christ. And yet they still have to fight against the fallenness of remaining sin, arming themselves for the incessant spiritual battle. You know, as a biblical counselor, one of the things that I, at the beginning of counseling, I try to help people get as a, a proper theology of sanctification. It's progressive sanctification. It's a fight. We're joyful. Our sins are forgiven. Our home in heaven is, is uh, assured. But it's not just sit back and let God. I wish God would win the battle uh, over my fleshiness. He left that for me to do through the power of the indwelling spirit. He's rescued us from the penalty of our sin. Eventually, we will be released from the presence of sin in His holy presence. But right now, He's regularly and daily delivering us from that power of sin in our lives and our expression. Failure to recognize the enemy within places a believer in danger. If we don't understand, as Paul, our wretchedness that remains. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. Like vigilant soldiers, Christians have to be on constant guard, not only against Satan and the world, but resident lusts of the flesh. Those who become prideful and overconfident make themselves easy targets for the enemy. And Peter's our example of that. The example of overconfidence. While he deeply loved the Lord, he left everything behind to follow Jesus. He heeded his preaching. He couldn't get enough of it. He witnessed Jesus' miracles, and he embraced him in saving faith. When people are leaving Jesus, and he says to his disciples, you guys going to go away too? It's Peter that said, where, where else are we going to go? Only you have the words of eternal life. We're staying put. He also is the one that confessed when Jesus asked the question, who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, through the inspiration of the Spirit of God, gives that great confession, thou art the Christ, or the Messiah, the Son of the living God. When it comes to Jesus washing his feet in the upper room in John 13, he wanted cleansing all over. You see, none was more vocal about loving their Lord than Peter. Yet on the same night that Judas betrayed Jesus, Peter denied him. I wish we had time to really develop this point of where we've already seen Peter go astray. If I, if I were to give you um, five, five words to sum it up, the first word might be boasted. He boasted too much in exclaiming just a few moments ago, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison and death. And even though everyone you said is going to fall away, I'll die for you. He boasted too much. Second word would be listened. He listened too poorly. As pride blinded his mind and deafened his ears, when Jesus said you're all going to fall away, what do you suppose Jesus meant? You're all going to fall away. Peter, you're not the exception to the rule. Listen to your master. Thirdly, he prayed too little. After Jesus' threefold prayer vigil in Gethsemane, he comes back, and Peter's the one he addresses by name. And actually, he doesn't use his new redeemed name, Peter. His old name, Simon. Because you're acting like Simon, not a rock, like Peter. He said, Simon... Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray. The fourth word to summarize would be acted. He acted too fast. So Judas kisses Jesus. The thugs wrap him in cords and take him away. And in all the brawl that's going on, Peter's the one that pulls out his sword and severs an ear from the high priest servant's head. He acted too fast. That's why he's impulsive. Fifthly, he followed. He followed too far. 
He's here at Jesus' religious trial, but he's at a distance. He's kind of caught between faith and fear, loyalty and terror, courage and cowardice. You know, he's curious to see what happens to his Lord. He loves him, and yet he's not brave enough to stand with Jesus. And as we look at Peter, eyeball to eyeball in the text of Scripture, I'd ask the question, how about you, dear friend? So be forewarned by Peter of the betrayal that lurks within and realize the grace for those that have succumbed to denying their Lord. Let's look at denial number one. Verses 66 to 68. Peter's down in the courtyard. All the Gospels, all four Gospels, candidly record these three denials, though the details vary considerably. The synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the denials are all told together, but John is the exception to the rule. John, in John 18, shows the initial denial, not even when questioned by everyone. He's coming through the gate, through the door, into this alcove, this courtyard, and that's his first one. And then the following three that we're so aware of sprang from recognition and challenge. On each occasion, he's challenged to declare his true relationship to Christ, but each time fails to give a brave witness. So this account in Mark is extraordinarily vivid, probably sharing Peter's own recollection to John Mark as John's getting ready to pen scripture. You see the scene. Peter is below in the courtyard, verse 66. You know, I got a, this picture in my mind of what it looked like. It's been years since I was able to go over to Israel, and uh, let me help try to formulate a picture in your mind of, of the scene. I used to have friends in Southern Cal. I spent nine years there, and when I moved away with uh, some guys, and I'd fly back to Shepherd's Conference, and we'd stay with some friends in an apartment. And these were, I think, two two story apartments, and um, you'd you'd access by uh, stairs on the outside. It's kind of a circle or a box, and there'd be a courtyard with a pool in the middle, so I could leave frigid Connecticut and fly out to swim in the pool uh, off time from uh, Shepherd's Conference preaching. Pretty cool. Similar here, this courtyard is the center of the high priest residence. A typical Roman villa or large Mediterranean home would have an open atrium enclosed by the rooms of the surrounding house around it. We're picking up here in verse 66 from verse 54 where we were told that Peter had followed him at a distance right in to the courtyard. So this is where the trial began and before it went upstairs into, into the upper rooms of the house. Well, one of the servant girls comes to him, may have been the, the, the one who admitted him to the courtyard in the first place. Suspicion and curiosity may have caused her to come out into the courtyard. I got I to gotta talk to this guy. And seeing Peter... Mark tells us she looked at him and blepo. We've got two participles. As she's seeing him, she is intentionally and intensely gazing at him. She sees this curious stranger, but then on that penetrating look, recalls having previously seen him in the company of Jesus. So she looks intently. She's gazing at him as the the, the thoughts are hatching in her mind. Ah, you've been with Jesus the Nazarene. She confronts him directly and realizes that the, the designation of Jesus as the Nazarene carries a, a contemptuous note to it. She's simply regurgitating how she's heard her superiors use it. Oh, that's Jesus from Nazarene. It's a term of derision further designated literally as the Jesus, the one on trial at that moment. That's the one. Her charge 
correctly defined Peter's relationship to Jesus, and she challenged him to admit it. So he admits it, right? No, he uh, denied it, verse 68, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are talking about. So he went out onto the porch. Perhaps the unexpectedness along with the publicity of exposure filled him with that, that flutter of anxiety in his stomach. Sudden pain, panic, excuse me. Instead of making a bold confession, he's done in private previously, he played the coward. You know, think of all the episodes, if you're a parent, how you've talked with your kids about peer pressure and fearing man more than they fear God. Being a people pleaser rather than a God pleaser. He wants a life without pain. And I don't know why, but probably the first song I heard my brother singing as he was taking voice lessons when we were growing up in the home was The Coward of the County. As I'm reading about this coward, people just called him yellow. He, he stammers in anxiety. He says, I neither know nor understand. The redundancy reflects that agitation. Two verbs to make his denial as emphatic as possible. Denying all knowledge and even understanding of what the maid's talking about. Both in theoretical knowledge and in practice. He failed on both counts, both in theory and practice. She singles him out. He flatly, directly denied her claim. It's a rather indirect denial, kind of a claim of ignorance. The term arneomai means to repudiate, to disown, to dis disdain or renounce, and it will be repeated later on in his next denial. Christian, understand that as a follower of Jesus, we are truth tellers. Jesus... Or, or Peter was not being rock solid in his boldness. He was being the coward as he catered to the anxiety. And I guess we ought to have a takeaway here. You know, if you if you've got a price tag, if you can, you will be bought. Just a matter of price. What's it going to take you to sell out? Well, he denies. He renounces Jesus and he goes out on the on the courtyard. Or excuse me, out on the porch. You're thinking it'd be a little safer place in the shadows rather than in front of the fire that was illuminating his face. But a change of place was no substitute for the change of heart that needed to take place. Now I preach from the New American Standard. There are certain translations like the New King James that have the next event that takes place now is a cock crowing. You're not going to see it if you're reading the Legacy Standard Bible or the New American Standard. It's omitted by many of the ancient manuscripts because the authenticity is uncertain. The United Bible Society puts it in brackets as questionable whether this cock crowed yet. Some use it as evidence the rationale that if Peter heard the cock crow, surely he would have repented. I'm not so convinced that he would have. Cranfield in his commentary suggests the possible omission is in order to make the denial seem a little less shameful than it was. It's just as shameful as Mark writes, it, writes about it. It could have happened. His agitated mind not heeded it. Conscience remaining unreached as man is good at silencing the guilt that rightfully comes with shame for transgression when we dishonor the Lord. Well, we got denial number two. Verses 69 and the first half of verse 17. Notice again, the servant girl saw him, so he, he changed his position where he's at, but not his response. He goes from the courtyard to the porch, and she saw him, began once more to say to the bystanders, ah, this is one of them. But again, he denied it. The maid is most naturally the same one who challenged him at the fire. You know, the previous text we looked at last week 
Peter is sitting with others at the fire warming himself. This is a cool night. Possibly returning to her job as doorkeeper, either that or maliciously following Peter, motivated out of a sense of self-importance. Of course, you don't know any busybodies who know your business more than you do, like this gal may have been. But uh, she says this is one of them. Where do these words come from? You know, it suggests that the, the presence of some of the disciples of Jesus had become the subject of discussion. You know that even though all fell away, not all are gone from this site. We, we're reading about Peter. John mentions, without using his name as he usually does, it's self-deflecting as he writes in his gospel. He's somewhere around the event. And so they start chattering about Jesus' followers. More people becoming animated and mentions another maid. So several are joining in and P Peter probably feels ganged up on. I can't keep this hush-hush. What's the consequences going to be? Are they going to shackle me too? So again, he denies it. The first denial, he claims ignorance. I don't understand your accusation. And here, flat out, I am no follower. Same word he used earlier, deny, repudiate, disown, disdain, or renounce. And that little word again notes the sh shameful, inexcusable repetition of his denial. The previous was kind of swept under the carpet in ignorance. This is an outright lie. No couching in nuances or deception of the real issue. It is out and out denial. Unless we still have any question in our mind how shameful it is, there's a third time. Just like Jesus told Peter would happen, three times you'll deny me. So as you continue in verse 70, you're told after a little while. Remember, often the details are left out. You know, this is the Reader's Digest gospel account. Mark is shorter than any of the other ones. There's a, a lot to every account in Scripture. And the author brings up what's important to him as the Holy Spirit moves each author to pen Scripture. They'll use their unique personality or perspective and sovereignly orchestrating it all to record the inspired and inerrant word. You say, okay, Pastor Parker, what, what's the big deal after a little time? Well, here's the big deal. Luke remarks it's been about an hour that's passed. This thing is not going away quickly. The bystanders were again saying. By now, Peter's identity has become a matter of general discussion. He's the, the center of their gossip chat in the courtyard. Having been accosted on the porch, he returns to the court, probably seeking to lose himself in the crowd. Maybe if I can just hide behind the other people here. But notice their astute connection here. When these bystanders get involved in what the maid's doing by saying, surely you're one of them, here's why they say it. You're a Galilean too. Matthew tells us it was his speech which made clear his Galilean origin. And don't one of you friends tell me you do not understand what he's talking about when you have fun of how I talk about the Psalms and I park my car in the dooryard being from Maine. You know, back in Maine where I'm from, we had these down easters. The the one the the fish guys on the coast. You think I've got a thick accent? I ain't got nothing. I got one grandmother still alive, Grammy Barb. And at my baby sister's wedding uh, she was introducing herself to one of the wedding party, and this guy says, I've never heard somebody called Bob before because my Grammy Barb says Bob. You know, and so Peter is talking like a Galilean, and Mark and Matthew's the one that tells us it's his speech that betrays him. They know exactly where he's from. According to John, there is a relative of Malchus. You know, the guy whose ear Peter excised from his head provided further circumstantial evidence by recalling that he had seen Peter in Gethsemane with Jesus. John eighteen twenty six. Now there was 
no more backing out through deception, through evasion, or lying. So Peter ups the ante. He began to curse and swear. Third accusation is his boldest. So is Peter's denial. Two more verbs to portray his frantic efforts to shake off the identification. He curses and he swears. Now, careful. We, we often warn you that as you read your English Bible, do not automatically use your English understanding and definitions. Lest you think that he's reverting to old habits of using foul language, as many suggest, curse is anathematizo, anathematize, to put under curse. Peter takes an oath in the course of his denials. Take him to the mat, so to speak. Or as you've heard people say, May, may, may God knock me dead, or however, however it goes. You know, we'd use the phrase, with God as my witness, like when you're called into court to testify under oath. That's what Peter's doing here. It is to bind yourself, what you're saying, with a curse. Further here, swear is not to cuss. It's to take an oath. We call the, the blessing and curse language in the culture of the Bible. Jesus is about to be hanged on a Cursed tree. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree as he is identified in the sinner's place. What Peter's doing is calling down the curse of God upon himself if he's not telling the truth. Step back, everyone, right? Lest you be too close to this lightning rod of the liar, the denier. We've moved from, I don't know what you're talking about, to I'm not a follower to capital letters, everything, I do not know him. His denial of his relationship has led to direct denial of Jesus himself. When when we read uh, this man that you're talking about that comes from his lips, he's suggesting that the only thing he knows about Jesus of Nazareth is what you guys are talking about. I don't know anything about him. He's not only been in camaraderie and fellowship with 11 other privileged disciples, but he's in the innermost circle. The circle of Peter, James, and John. Who got to go up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus? Peter was one of the three. Who got to, you know, all the disciples went to Gethsemane to pray with Jesus or to fall asleep during prayer meeting. And it's those three that got to go a bit further right where Jesus is at, praying. Privilege. That's why his disloyalty is so much more severe. He's combined a breach of promise, conscious falsehood, and personal disloyalty in this third. As one put it, Peter plunges, desperate and reckless, into this last depth of falsehood and disloyalty. You say, all right, we're going on and on about three denials. What's the results? Well, the results is in our last verse of the chapter. Immediately, a rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had made the remark to him before a rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. And he began to weep. What's the results of all of this? It's remorse. Do you know that there's a difference between penance and repentance? Penance is what man wants to offer for a substitute to kind of buy God off or to, or to solve our conscience. You know, masochist. You know, if I can cause myself some pain so I feel worse, God will feel better about my sin. No. Contrast this with Judas. Judas, out of his supposed remorse, went out and hanged himself. So there was remorse without repentance. So immediately a a rooster crows a second time. It's mentioned in all four Gospels. Luke adds, while he yet 
spoke. Peter doesn't get this first denial hardly out of his lips. Mark alone says it's the second time. All of a sudden, he's remembering at the moment of conviction, registered forcefully in Peter's mind, ringing in his ears, the threefold prediction. Well, Peter denied at least four times. He comes in the gate denying, and then these three that we all are accustomed to reading about. It stirred a vivid recollection of the specific utterance Jesus had spoken in his warning that very night. Back in verse 30 is where Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you that this very night before a rooster crows, you yourself will deny me three times. You yourself, emphatically. Nobody else, just you, Peter. Luke alone records that at that very moment, Luke twenty-two sixty-one, as if the pain of his shame is not enough, Luke tells us that Jesus turned and looked at Peter. Eyeball to eyeball, connected. And the remembrance of his Lord's warning, along with his sad look of love, broke the frantic tension of Peter's fear and awakened his conscience that had been lulled to sleep. He was not watching, he was not praying, so he was denying. This opened the door for true repentance. He, he began to weep. Now again, let's, let's understand that tears is not necessarily accompanying repentance. Not everyone responds the same way. Many times there's a worldly sorrow. Sorry I got caught. Sorry I got my hands caught in the cookie jar. With an awakened mind and a broken heart, Peter sobs. There's much self-flagellation and worldly sorrow that substitutes in the human experience. That is not this. The old preacher J. Vernon McGee, who used to wake me up at 5.30 every morning on the, on the radio, he aptly remarks, Peter could repent of his sin, and that is the real test of a genuine believer. You know, friend, if you know Christ, you know what this is. Our asking for forgiveness since coming to Christ is markedly different. When we sin with impuni- with, with, without any consequences as, as, as pagans, now when we sin, we wake up in the morning and we hate ourselves. That's the big difference. Jesus had earlier said, if any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, when I just use that phrase, hate yourself, I know that doesn't go well with sensitivity training and political correctness of our day. It doesn't go well with the heresy of self-esteem and self-love that is rampant in our human experience. So to give you a term that you likely won't forget, let me just borrow from the old reformer Martin Luther. As you know, he helped launch the Protestant Reformation. At the time, he was a Roman Catholic priest who came to understand the truth of salvation by grace through faith in Christ. Grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, for the glory of God alone revealed in Scripture alone. Those would be the solas of the Reformation. He determined he'd confront the Roman Catholic system, the great monolithic system of error and deception, and he selected 95 different statements, 95 protests. That's why we're called Protestants. Different assertions that ran contrary to Catholic dogma. He wrote them down, he nailed them on the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. Well, the fourth of his protests, the fourth of his 95 assertions was that a penitent heart, you know, he's he's helping rescue the gospel. This is what we need to understand. A heart that comes to God and receives salvation is characterized by, here's his term, self-hate. Self-hate. Luther's fourth statement, quote, and so penance remains while self-hate remains. 
He said that self-hate was the true interior penitence. This, said Luther, is essential to the gospel. Whereas the Roman system, like every system of self-righteousness and earning salvation by ceremonies and good deeds as a wash in self-love, Luther confronted it. He said, until the sinner comes to hate himself, he does not enter the kingdom of God. You have in the very birth of Protestantism, the very birth of the gospel, as it were, out from under its rock where it was hidden for a thousand years, at its very launch, the gospel is defined as being founded upon the sinner's self-hatred. In the first beatitude, Jesus pronounces of his children that come to him by faith, poverty of spirit. I got nothing to offer you, Lord, except the sin that makes my salvation necessary. Hating oneself, comes to see that there is in the flesh no good thing, that there is nothing of value, nothing of worth, that whereas Jeremiah said, deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That doesn't sound like self-love to me. Every part of us is sick. Isaiah put it, from the head to the toe, no good thing anywhere. Nothing about us that has value. Nothing about us that has worth. There's nothing about us that's deserving of honor or accolade. Again, it's to come to this beatitude attitude of spiritual bankruptcy. God, I am the sinner. That's my diagnosis. Not a great religious person. Not right with you. You know, as Paul confessed, it's all dung. It's manure. This doesn't sell in the cult of self-love. Frankly, it's Absolutely absurd to suggest that a person could encounter a holy God, the righteous God, and enter his kingdom without wanting to be delivered from sin and without wanting to be delivered from understanding sin as sin really is has to be understood. It's just as wicked and pervasive and dominant in our, in our lives as the Bible diagnoses it. Those who meet God must meet God on his terms enter to enter his kingdom. And they have an overwhelming sense of their sinfulness. You know, the one difference between us as believers and those when we were unbelievers is that He's incredibly and forgiven and graciously forgiven my sin debt. And we hate ourselves, wretched man that I am, when we commit treachery against our God, whom we love. So throughout the Gospel of Mark, the disciples have misunderstood Jesus. One even betrays him secretly, Judas. Peter's renunciation is the first open denial of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. And the fact that it comes from the chief apostle makes it all the more vigorous and bold. Peter's example as a disciple is, an, is a warning to disciples. Then and now. The faithful witness to Jesus is most important and most easily betrayed in simple and ordinary actions and words. We do that throughout our days, in other words. It's in everyday matters that disciples are true witnesses. Let that sink in. Not even the best Christian or the lead apostle is immune to selling out and falling away. That is in our hearts. But here's some graciously good news. Nor is it beyond the promise of grace. At this point, Peter drops completely out of the picture until after the crucifixion. Terrible shame of his base denials with their public implications. It shamed not only him, but his teacher. It's brought shame on the name of Christ, his motley crew of disciples that are going to advance his ministry when he ascends. Such a blot and a blemish was only wiped out through the risen Christ who appears to Peter at the empty tomb. You know, one can take solace from the account of Peter's denials. Peter is the most prominent of the disciples, yet he's still a sinner in need of God's mercy. He thought he'd die for Jesus, but he needed Jesus to die for him. His failure reveals the truth of Jesus' statement way back in chapter 2 and verse 17. That it's not for the healthy 
We need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come for the righteous, but for sinners. You see, the religious crowd that were in the process of crucifying Jesus were too big to get saved. They couldn't enter in with nothing. But a sinner who is brought to the end of himself recognizes his need. Mark is the gospel of second chance. The angel's command in chapter 16, verse 7, go tell his disciples and Peter holds the promise of his restoration. There were probably saints when Mark penned this gospel account who had already betrayed and denied their Lord that needed that good news of grace. If Peter could be restored after denying his Lord, even cursing him, then there's hope for others who might be guilty of the same or worse. Peter's tears that end the scene, these tears of remorse, mark the beginning of that restoration. There's such gospel hope to not only salvage this story, but the countless stories of treachery and betrayal for all who repent and believe in Christ who own their sin, who make biblical confession, not blame-shifting on others, not minimizing the heinousness, but seeking forgiveness and reconciliation. That, my friends, is what the Lord's table preaches to us every time we celebrate it. The church can be honest about sin, even the sins of major failure, because it's so convinced of grace. As the beloved Apostle Paul says to the saints at Rome, that where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Pray with me. Father, as we get ready now to think afresh on Calvary, as we sang earlier, Lord, lead us to Calvary. Help us never to get beyond the wonder of it all. Lord, would you take away the callousness? Some of us have been saved for many, many years. We've lost the wonder of it all. Help us as Luther admonishes us to preach the gospel to ourselves every day because we forget it every day. Great sinners need a great Savior who lavishes His grace upon us for the praise of His great name. In fact, your name we pray now. Amen. I'm going to ask the men to come now and to...